I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'm speaking with Mr. Schneider. He is the Chief Economist for Emerging Europe at the Institute of International Finance in Washington, D.C. Hello, Mr. Schneider. Welcome to UATV. Thank you. Good morning. You said in your report in December when you visited Ukraine that the economic situation had stabilized, but there was still a lack of urgency on the political front which could undermine financial stability in Ukraine. Could, could you elaborate on that? Well, I think that what we observe in Ukraine for the last two years is a tremendous amount of reform that has taken place in the uh, financial sector. We've seen a substantial stabilization on the public finance uh, front. Uh, what we were referring to when we mentioned that there seems to be a lack of reforms, we were referring to a lack of structural reforms, by which we mean privatization and, and, and raising the productivity of the Ukrainian economy at large. Ukraine has been in, in this post-transition transition process for 20 years, 25 years now almost. And I think what, what still has not been achieved is, is, a, is a transition from this post-Soviet system of, of large enterprises, often state-owned, to a normal dynamic market economy. And that's what, what we're referring to and what we think it still needs to be done. And without these reforms, the Ukraine will, will remain in this shadow uh, area between uh, command economy and market economy. As far as privatization, what industries would you like to see you know, accelerated in the privatization? Well, we, we don't have any particular list of, of, of industries or firms that should be prioritized, but our experience so from other countries in the region, we look at the emerging Europe and we look at countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, we've seen a turnaround turn around in their performance once they become interesting for foreign investors. And uh, when foreign investors started to fill uh, space available for them in an economy. So it could be anything. Uh, like Slovakia is big in, in car production. Poland is not that much. So, you know, it, it depends on, on a structural economy, depends on, uh, on advantages. And I would leave this for investors to find what, what they think is most productive for them, most profitable for them. You noted that the nationalization of private bank was a step in the right direction. Why, why was private bank nationalized? Well, I, I guess you should ask the, the regulator, which is the Central Bank of Ukraine, National Bank of Ukraine, uh, about our feelings when we were in Ukraine, and we've been there many, many times, is that private bank was always the, the stumbling block in, in the financial sector reform. It was the biggest bank in a country, or still is the biggest bank in the country, uh, but it was run in a not a very transparent way, and it was run, it was my understanding at least, uh, mostly for the benefit of the shareholders. And when you have a, such a huge institution at the heart of your financial system, you cannot really reform the financial sector without uh, gaining control of this and making this bank no work as a normal bank, uh, which is the bank that works for the benefits of, sh of all sh shareholders, stakeholders, but also for, for the economy. So without actually making the private bank a normal bank, I don't think that the, the central bank would be able to transform the financial sector completely. Speaking of the head of the central bank, it looks like she will be stepping down. How much does that worry you? Well, we have heard this before, uh, so, you know, no, nobody is inerciable. Uh, I think Mrs. Guntareva has done a tremendous work, and she's been associated with the, the biggest progress in the in financial sector. Uh, the central bank has been completely transformed. I think the central bank is the biggest success, in, uh, at least from, from the point of view of the foreign investors. So losing her would be, would be of course, a loss, but then the question is who eventually replace her. So I think this is this would not be a good news, uh, but all depends on what happened next. Uh, if, she, if she goes, who will, be, who will be replaced by? What do you think the economic growth rate in Ukraine will be this year? And what are some of the risk factors? Uh, these are rather, you know, this, this is quite a difficult question, not because the Ukrainian economy is so difficult or so special, uh, but there are two aspects to that. The first one, we still very much depend on development in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine is still in war. The part of the other country is, uh, is not under control of the, of the government. And the developments in eastern Ukraine, Donbass, will, will influence the, the, the whole economy. So assuming that nothing special happens, assuming there was no uh, escalation in the conflict in eastern Ukraine, but also assuming um, that the government will not be able to, to regain the control of that, 
uh, region. We believe that the, the economy will keep growing at, at a modest pace, uh, something between 2.5%, maybe 3% a year, which is not a bad number, but given the uh, decline in, in GDP in previous years, I think it's still underperforming uh, what it could achieve. How encouraged are you by the news that the head of the fiscal service, the tax chief, has been arrested? Again, this this is really this is really difficult for someone outside the country to fully understand. Uh, we've been saying and we've been repeating the the arguments of the IMF and other investors that the corruption is an issue, and uh, in Ukraine it's a big issue. And we also understood from our discussion that the, that the fiscal service was uh, one of the more corrupt uh, institutions in the country. So I have no information how much the head of the of the service was was personally involved, and I have no information who will be replay who will replace him if he is indeed uh, removed from his position. So. Um, Potentially, it might be a good news if, if he is a person who is associated with the corruption and he's removed and replaced by someone who is honest and working for benefits of Ukraine. Uh, but this is something that the people in Ukraine know much better than people looking on Ukraine from the United States or from, from Europe. Now, you've written that the public debt will likely increase over what the IMF predicts by 2020. What, uh, what are some of the risks of that happening, of public debt increasing that much? Yeah, well, we are looking, now we are comparing uh, our forecast with forecast with IMF. And IMF has set up a program which is quite ambitious for Ukraine. And we believe that uh, the debt uh, metrics, which is used by the IMF, is, is maybe too strict. Uh, Ukraine has had a problem with competitiveness in the past. And uh, Ukraine has to uh, get away from fixation of the exchange rate. The Hrivnia, uh, fixation of Hrivnia has been Bane of the of the of the, of the economic policy in, in the country. So we believe uh, that the transition will be needed for more free exchange rate. And if you have a freer exchange rate, floating exchange rate, there is a potential for further depreciation of currency, which I think is not such a huge problem. It might be a psychological block for for people in Ukraine. I understand that. Uh, but if if Hrivnia depreciates, it will improve the competitiveness of the economy. But it might also increase the debt. So what we are saying is that maybe the, the transformation scenario will be, look a little different from the IMF has prognosed. Um, they assume that the Ukraine will be able to grow quite a fast without depreciation of the currency. Our experience with Ukraine says that it might be too ambitious. Uh, we, we might expect that uh, there might be more depreciation than the IMF currently uh, predicts. And that leads us to the conclusion that the debt might be a little higher. But what we say in our report as well is that we should not be fixated on one particular number. It's not a big deal whether the public debt is 85 or 90 percent. Um, it's high. It will be a problem for, for years to come. But whether it's 85 or 90 is really not a difference. Speaking of debt, you know, Ukraine and Russia are in court in UK over the bond deal. What uh, could you ex briefly explain that case and where do you think it'll lead? Uh, I am afraid this is too. Uh, too detailed. Uh, we we know we understand the basics, of course. Uh, Russia claims that uh, the the three billion bond that uh, Russia extended to the regime of previous uh, President Yanukovych was a, just a standard loan, and it should be repaid as every, every, everything else. And it, they claim it's a sovereign uh, debt. Uh, Ukraine sees it differently. Um, the courts will have to decide. Um, I. I understand all the political and social consequences of this deal, and I actually don't see how Ukraine can repay this debt without resolving the situation in eastern, eastern Ukraine. So I think this is a this is long-term issue that will stay with us for a long time, and it will, it will drag for years. If I'm a CEO of a multinational company or even a hedge fund manager, and I want to invest in Ukraine, what is your expert advice? <laughs> Well, you need to be very careful. Uh, you need to choose wisely. Uh, there is not that ma many uh, instruments uh, to invest in Ukraine, to be honest. Uh, so for investors, for financial investors, uh, I think Ukraine is quite a challenging uh, country still. What, what, where opportunities are, I believe, are for foreign direct investment. It might make more sense to invest in Ukraine in, in physical assets to, to start production of things. That Ukraine is a country of, of skilled people 
uh, huge opportunities in agriculture, huge opportunities in IT. So actually, you can produce things in Ukraine cheaper and maybe in a better quality than you can elsewhere uh, in Europe. And uh, so if you invest there, if you, if you invest wisely and if you are in a way lucky that uh, your investment uh, is, uh, is in a stable in, uh, industry, then you, you can reap a benefit. Uh, as a financial investor, it's, it's much more challenging. Uh, there, there's more volatility in financial instruments in Ukraine than elsewhere. It's still country in the middle of the transition. So I would be, it's very difficult to, to give a specific advice on, on, the, on that front. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Schneider. Really appreciate it. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. That was Mr. Schneider. He is the regional economist for Emerging Europe for the Institute of International Finance in Washington, D.C. Thank you.